How are we doing, students? I hope you are having the greatest day of your life today. Today, I want to talk about a classic AP Physics 1 question, which involves a ball striking a rod, and this has to do with the topic of angular momentum. It's a concept and something that you're going to see a lot. So I just wanted to work through some different examples and show you how angular momentum can be used when finding out a ball or a particle that's going to strike a rod. Now, if I have some sort of mass and is moving in a straight line, we know that it has some sort of tangential speed. Now this tangential speed is what gives it momentum, P equals mv. So it's pretty intuitive that it has some sort of linear momentum, but the fact that it also has angular momentum can be a little bit tricky for kids to understand. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is how a particle moving in a straight line also has an angular momentum as well. And how do we know that a particle has an angular momentum? Well, pretty much what we're going to do is we're going to look at the law of conservation momentum and see what happens when a ball strikes an actual rod. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a pivot point, and I'm going to draw a long rod. And then I have some mass that's going to be approaching that rod with some linear speed. Well, if I look initially, what is the momentum of this rod in an angular fashion? Well, if the speed of that is equal to zero, therefore L is equal to zero. But now, after the ball strikes the rod, the rod is going to start to spin in a fashion like this. Let's say this is an overhead view and we're like on a frictionless table. So now, this thing is going to have some angular speed greater than zero, and therefore, it now has a momentum that's greater than zero. So where did it get that angular momentum from? It got it from right here, from that particle. Okay, so the proof that the particle actually had an angular momentum that it transferred to the rod because there's no other outside torques that can cause a rotation. Granted, yes, the pivot point does add some force to the rod, but it's at r equals zero, so there's no torque. So the only thing that causes rotation is the impact of this ball, the force of the ball hitting here, and then there's going to be a transfer of angular momentum from the ball into the rod. So that's the proof that this ball, in fact, has an angular momentum before it strikes the rod. So our next question then begins, how much angular momentum does it have? And to be honest, it depends on how far away from the pivot point we are or how far we are from the center of rotation. And we've seen this happen time and time again where this distance from the center of rotation affects angular motion as compared to linear. For example, like linear velocity is r omega. Linear acceleration is r alpha. And linear distance is r theta. So we see that this R is coming into play in lots of things in rotation, and this is also going to be true here. So let's look at two more examples here so we can see what I'm talking about. If I had a rod that was like this, as this ball approached the pivot point, when it strikes the pivot point, is this rod now going to spin? And the answer is no, it is not, because there's going to be no torque force that's applied, because when it strikes this, the R is going to be equal to zero. And we know that torque is equal to some F perpendicular and then times R. So right here, there's going to be no transfer of angular momentum because R is equal to zero. And R, the distance, depends on how much angular momentum the particle has. In contrast, if that mass now strikes out here, there is, in fact, some R away from the axis of rotation. And this R is going to change as it gets to the rod. And once it impacts the rod right here, so at the impact, I'm going to say that the distance from the angle, I'm going to make this capital R. And because this is a nice right triangle and I'll have one of these angles, I can call this theta. And I would need that theta to find this R. But right here, this is easy to measure. So now I can expand my definition of angular momentum. Now, we know angular momentum to be, to be I omega. But now I can also say that it's going to equal the mass of this little ball, its linear speed times its point of impact. This becomes a little bit of like an angular momentum trick. And it's not so much a trick. Essentially what we did is we just changed angular velocity into this linear velocity. Let me show you what I mean. We know that VT, as I just wrote, is R omega, right? That was right here. So if I substitute in, I could say that L equals M r omega times r. When I simplify that, I see m r squared omega. And we know that m r squared is the i of a point particle. 
So essentially, it's the same. L equals I, bring this down, omega. It's still the same formula, but now I can use a linear speed as opposed to an angular velocity. So when given a linear speed, I can use this little formula to find out what the angular momentum is of the object. Now, a question I get asked all the time is, hey, Finn, like, doesn't the ball or the particle itself have its own angular momentum? Like, isn't it spinning? And I say, yes, but we kind of, we factor that in, you can see, and we're translating that into a linear speed. Like, don't forget what angular momentum means. It means how hard it is to get an object from stop rotating. This is different than the moment of inertia, which is to, you know, the resistance of change of that object to want to start spinning or slowing down. When we're talking about angular momentum, we're just talking about how difficult is it to get an object to stop rotating? And yes, both angular velocity and linear velocity are going to matter. But in this case, in the transfer of angular momentum from one object to another, we're only going to be worried about this linear speed. So if I give you the angular speed of the ball approaching the rod as opposed to its linear speed, you can do the exact same thing. But the, the problem that I saw students having is when, in fact, they gave you this linear speed and they forgot this relationship because they were so used to using this formula. So let's look at an example of using this formula right here in two different ways. So I have a pivot point right here, and then I have a rod. This rod has a mass of 2m, and it has a length of l. You know me, I love to work in variables. A particle with mass m approaches the rod with some linear speed of vt. Now, some other given information that would be in this problem is that the rod has a uniform density. So I can give you that moment of inertia equal to one third m l squared. And I'm also going to tell you that when the ball strikes the rod, it stops. And this just makes the problem a little bit more straightforward. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what you're going to have to do if the ball doesn't stop. For example, like say it hit the rod and bounced back, we'll get there. So the question now asks, what is the angular velocity omega of the rod right after the collision? So let's start with how we started with every conservation of momentum problem that we've done the whole year, whether it's been linear or angular. We say that the initial momentum is going to be equal to the final momentum. Then we look at how many objects we are. When we did linear momentum, we had two carts. Now I have a rod and I have a ball. So what I'm going to need is I'm going to need the linear momentum of the rod plus the linear momentum of the ball, and that has to equal the linear momentum of the rod after, plus the momentum of the ball after. Now, initially, the rod has no omega, so that's going to go to zero. And after, I say the ball stops, so that's going to go to zero. So now I just need to work on the linear momentum of the ball equal to the linear momentum of the rod. The linear momentum of the ball, we just solved for to be m, v times its impact point, which is now really just going to be L. So I'm going to clean that up and I'm going to say little m vt L. That has to be equal to the angular momentum of the rod, which is going to be I omega. So now I know students right away are going to say, hey Finn, how do we know when to use I omega and when do we know to use m linear speed L. To be honest, it, you don't have to remember this. This is just a trick. If, for example, you didn't, let's say that you went right off the bat and you said that the linear momentum of the ball initially was equal to I omega. That would be 100% okay because I would then say that, okay, what is the I of a point particle? Well, that's M R squared omega. But we don't know the omega of the ball. We know the V linear. So I know that V linear over R equals omega. So now I can re-plug this in and say M R squared V T over R. When I cancel some stuff out, I get this goes away and this goes away and voila. We just have M R V. And this R is just the impact point, which is going to be L. So we see that this M L V even if you started with the original I omega, you would have gotten to where you need to go. This is just, I kind of just skipped all of this when I know that for this interaction, when I'm given VT, I know I can say M V T L. To be honest, going this route right here is always a good idea because, you know, there's less like to make mistakes. But I just want to show you that it does not matter 
if you go right to this when you're given the linear speed of an object. So now I bring this up here. I say that I have M, V, T, L. The I was given as one third M. Now what's the M of the rod? Well, the M of the rod is 2M. So I'm going to say 2M, L squared. This term, that's your I right here which is really just I of the rod after, and then some omega final, this is what we want to solve for. So I really know that this is two over three. I'm going to multiply both sides by three over two to get rid of that, start to clean this up a little bit. We see three over two MVT L equals ML squared omega, divide both sides by ML squared. I see that omega final is going to be equal to three halves, that VT over L. Now I told you that this thing stopped. Now what happens if it didn't stop? Well, the only thing that would be different if this thing didn't stop, like let's say it bounced back with a speed of like VT or one half VT. Okay, all the, the only thing that would change is you'd still have the same momentum before VTMR and you'd still have the same IW of the rod, but now you would just have some M. VT R of the ball. So you just add this term here where you'd have M of the ball. This would just become one half VT and that R at the impact would still be L. That's the only thing you do if it was not stopped. Now let's look at one more example where I actually use numbers and I don't use variables so you guys can actually solve for something. Let's look at a bullet. We'll say that bullet has a mass equal to 20 grams and it has a linear speed that's equal to 330 meters per second. It is going to embed inside this rod. The rod has a uniform density and it's initially at rest. The I of this uniform density rod is one third m l squared. It has an L equal to two meters and it has a mass capital M equal to five kilograms. So in this example, so I don't screw up my M's, I'm going to use a lowercase m and a capital M. And I want to know what is going to be the final speed of this rod and bullet system after the bullet embeds inside the rod. So this is similar to the mega mass problems that I did earlier in the year when two cars stick together. So now because there's no outside forces giving torque to this system, I know that momentum is going to be conserved. So if I look at the total momentum before, right, I'm going to have the momentum of the bullet plus the momentum of the rod. Now all this needs to be equal to the momentum final, which is really going to be the momentum of the bullet plus rod system. Now in this example, I won't use that MRV trick. I will start right from what we traditionally know momentum to be. So I'll say IB times omega B plus the I of the rod, omega rod. That needs to be equal to the I of the B plus the I of the R times the final speed. So this, once again, just like linear, when the two cars stuck together, we took their masses. The moment of inertia acts a lot like mass when it comes to rotation. Now the eye of the bullet, it's acting as a particle, so it is going to be m r squared, and that gets multiplied by the omega of b. But once again, we don't know the omega of b, but I know that vt equals r omega, so omega equals vt over r. So I can now multiply that by VT over R, plus the initial momentum of the rod, which is going to be zero because it had no speed. That's going to be equal to M R squared plus one third M L squared times omega final. Now we know the impact point is going to happen at L. So I'm going to take all these R's. I'm just going to make them L's. So I'm going to say lowercase M L squared times VT over L equals, I'm going to come back over here, M L squared plus one third. This is the rod, so I'm going to say that's capital M, so I don't confuse them, L squared. That whole term is going to be omega final. I can cancel this L with this. Then I'm going to divide this whole term up here by this. And I'm going to say that omega final is equal to M L V T that's given up here 
divided by this whole bottom term, m l squared plus one third capital M L squared. I could now start to sub in 0 0.02 kilograms because I had to convert that from grams times two meters times 330. That's going to get divided by 0 0.02 times two meters squared plus one third, one third five kilograms times two meters squared. So on the top, I get 13.2 radians per second. On the bottom, I get 0 0.08 plus, what, 20 over 3. So I get 13.2 divided by 6.7. And that gives me an answer of 1.97 radians per second. And that's how you'd solve for that. Guys, if you have any questions about this stuff, just leave them in the comments below. This is a question you are going to see most likely on any AP or any entrance exam. It's a very, very classic angular momentum question. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys.